1977, my mother founded the Greenbelt Movement to plant trees across Kenya, restore green spaces and protect green spaces, much like Karura Forest. is the tree. A tree has a personality and as it grows and it changes the landscape, it also change, seems to change the minds of the people and it, it brings with it a certain rapport that actually encourages people to do more. Uh, I'm Wanjira Mathai. I am a mother to wonderful daughters. Uh, my husband and I uh, are privileged to be raising them, of course. Uh, I work as the Vice President and Regional Director for Africa at the World Resources Institute. I'm also really proud to chair the Wangari Mathai Foundation and to be a full member of the Greenbelt Movement. So work that is very much a part of the legacy and also to be affiliated with the Wangari Mathai Institute. Tree planting couldn't be more important. I think that the, we, we know the science is telling us that climate change will disproportionately affect Africa. So my day-to-day -day, um, preoccupation is with my job, which is with the, the, leading the World Resources Institute's activities in Africa. And it's uh, really about refreshing uh, what we do here. WRI has been working in Africa for over 30 years, mainly in forest conservation in Central Africa. But our work is now expanding. There are main global challenges that uh, we address around water, energy, food, climate, uh, forests, oceans, and all of these issues are really in many ways the global challenges of our time. Uh, and what we're trying to do on the African continent is to see which ones will make the biggest difference, which ones will transform the lives of Africans the most. And so we will not do everything that WRI does, but the wonderful thing is that WRI has very deep expertise in very specific areas. And so we're bringing together critical work around three specific pillars of work. One is around vital landscapes. We're saying that it's really important that we ensure the integrity of our landscapes. We know now more than ever that biodiversity and the integrity of our biodiversity is extremely important and that if we encroach, things happen. COVID-19 happened and that's a really important lesson. But vital landscapes is about our rural landscapes and how we ensure that they continue to give us the ecosystem services we enjoy, water, food, and ensure that they mitigate and help us adapt against climate change. So there's a whole body of work around um, forests and landscapes. Then we're also looking at cities. As cities go, we say, so goes the planet. The way we develop our cities, the way our cities urbanize, is going to be uh, extremely instructive in terms of how we manage to survive uh, the changes that are inevitably coming, especially for us in sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, we're really interested in mobility, issues of how do we ensure that when we are developing uh, roads and, and mobility opportunities, we're inclusive. Are we including everybody or are we just building infrastructure for cars? You know, one of the things that is really a great opportunity for us on the continent is that a majority of the infrastructure we need for the next 50 years has not been developed yet. So we have an opportunity on the African continent to develop in a very sober way, a way that is resilient and follow a more green pathway, a way that is low carbon, because we know the hazards of climate change and what's happening and increasing emissions. We have got to make a difference in this next decade. I know you know we are calling this the decade of action. It has to be the decade of action. So much has to happen, including the Sustainable Development Goals. 2030 is a short 10 years away, and we have to do something 
really transformative. Young people in this con on this continent are going to be the ones who deliver on these commitments. They're energized, they are brilliant in their ideas, they're innovative, and they're operating on a level of consciousness we have not yet seen before. Great, now, you know, the Wangai Mathai Foundation uh, is a really important part of the work we're doing. And, and absolutely, all of this work is connected because I believe fundamentally that we are who we are because of the influences of our youth, of our childhood. And the Wangai Mathai Foundation has decided to focus its work on inspiring leadership, future leadership, but doing so at an early age. That if we intervene early, is our understanding and belief, we can make a difference later. Actually, quite frankly, if you look at just about anybody you admire in the world, if you were to read their story, a lot of them found inspiration or were, um, were inspired and shaped by the experiences of their childhood. Wangari Mathai being one of them, because the foundation is really a legacy to her work and her life. And as we unpack who she was and why she did what she did, you realize that playing with tadpoles in Ihide was a very important part of her environmentalism. And so environmentalism and who we become is shaped very early in life. For me, the biggest challenge is governance. Because the people at the top have power. Because they have power, they, can, they, they have control of resources. They have a lot of privileges and they can continue to increase these privileges uh, from where they sit. And the public at the grassroots can continue to suffer. I have to acknowledge, like you said, that to think that the work that she did 40 years ago is relevant now is part of the opportunity that I see, right? We always just feel like, I can't do anything, I'm just one person. But look what it, what it has meant. Nobody knew COVID-19 was coming. And we are one of the few places in the world that can boast Karura Forest right in the middle of a city. We're fortunate, we're lucky, but it took some really courageous men and women to go out and say enough. And that's the challenge to our generation and to the other generations coming, is to be able to do that. And that's really the work of the foundation. But many people think that's who my mother was all the time. That's what she did for work. You know, you do this for work, I do this for work, and then I go home and I can play with the children and I do what I do. But my mother was, yeah, very much um, uh, who she was as a mother. I mean, we, I admired her as a mother. She was extremely liberal in her, her thinking and in her approach. So never once did she ever tell me that this, there's a thing called environment that we need to, to consider. I never studied environment. I never did anything to do with the environment, but she always said, you know, do whatever you want, whatever would be, would be. She was very attentive to things, your interests. So I remember my brother was very interested in drumming and she encouraged him to continue. You know, if he would drum or if she would notice your you're swimming and you're a good swimmer that she wanted you to continue. So it was about whatever you wanted to do. There was no limit and there was never once. I remember being asked to study environment. However, I was a scientist and it was perhaps part of the fact that she excelled in science and so we had a lot of resources uh, that interested me in science. So biology, chemistry were very interesting to me and that's what I ended up studying and I actually ended up going into public health. I was in public health because I wanted to go, I thought I wanted to go into medicine but then I decided after going on a visit to a university medical school we walked into the gross anatomy lab and I was like no thank you very much. I went back to my advisor and I said what else can I do that is not core medicine but with this science and he directed me towards public health which was wonderful because he could I knew that I wanted to spend time working with people but I didn't end in science in medicine really it was in health after some years I just decided I wanted to take a break and I did I took a break I came home and I was just you know hanging out as young people do <laughs> and, I, and then I decided and then of course my mother started to ask me to help but it wasn't to help with anything strategically to get me uh, uh, engaged. But you know, can you help me read 
some of these emails? Can you help me write some of these letters? I was doing a lot of writing and fundraising in the previous job, so maybe she, she asked, can you help me with this? And very slowly I got involved in the work of the Greenbelt Movement, more from an operational side. I started to support my mother's um, work and the, what she was doing. And that was in the, I think it was 2000. And of course I got, and I had come home for just a year to, to relax. I had said, okay, after one year I'll go back and sort of get back into my professional career and think about what I wanted to do next. And I remember two years passed, three years passed, and then the fourth year, 2004, I remember deciding, okay, this is a good year to go back and sort of see my friends and, and, and get re-engaged with my public health and business. I had been to business school at the time as well. So I went back, uh, I went and I told my mom that, okay, this has been great. I've really enjoyed the work. And I finally, I was in my thirties, right? I finally understood the profundity of the work she was doing because I, as a child, you just see pieces of it. And she took us to meet the women and we went and we did some of the Greenbelt movement planting and we were part of her work. She brought us in, but we were not a, a very active part of what was happening. And I certainly didn't connect the dots to what was happening. Um, of course, the, the very difficult 80s and 90s, the ac activism at the time, I was very aware of what was happening. But I remember just after that stint working with her, really appreciating how profound and transformative the work of the Greenbelt Movement was. And really, I have not seen since then any other organization that does the level of work to transform. Very heavy lifting, very difficult work, but really transformative. And that what we see as tree planting was really in many ways um, the entry point, but there was a lot more transformative going on around socioeconomic status, around confidence building, around livelihood protection, and around civic engagement, so that people were starting to understand that the environment was very much a part of who they were, and that they had a responsibility to take care of it. We have 10 years to deliver on AFR 100, on the commitments for restoring 100 million hectares on our continent by 2030. That we must do, but we cannot do that if we don't include youth. Well, it's just, I just got sucked into the work. I just loved, I found myself enjoying what I was doing in, in a way that I thought, why, where am I going to do what? This is really fulfilling. And then, it, and then it came that in 2004, my mother was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And I was right there. I knew how profound again that moment was. And I wanted to be there to support her, but also that the work that I had finally also come to acknowledge and see as profound had been acknowledged internationally. So in many ways, it validated what I was feeling that, wow, this work is amazing, but it may never be seen. It may never come to anybody. And there's many others like this doing transformative work who never get seen. And that the, to shine the light on the work of the Greenbelt Movement through the way my mother had um, really inspired its growth was really powerful. And I just knew then that this was where I was meant to be and that perhaps I came back when I did precisely for that moment to really support and take on um, the role that I then did for many years until her passing. We recognized that when people have degraded their environment or when the resources become very scarce, they begin to compete over these resources. And as they compete, conflict ensues. Interesting, I don't see it as a turn. It was just a continuation. It was very much bringing to bear what I had learned. I was a scientist underneath, but all the work that I had done with communities, whether I was dealing with health or dealing with the environment, was really generally the same. It was about uh, reaching people in a very authentic way getting, communicating effectively 
connecting the dots that everything is connected. I didn't see that as a departure from what I was doing. In fact, I felt like I was deepening my work and I was sort of going deeper. So I didn't feel like I've made a shift. I just felt like this is where I'm supposed to be. I really believe that those are the moments. And you know, so often you're told the road will fork, you know, just take the road less traveled. I really believe that, that you just go, that's where you're where you're meant to be. Don't question it, don't ask questions, and don't begin to rationalize. It is exactly where you're supposed to be. And that's what I believed then, and I still believe it now. Africa is known for its abundance of resources, remarkable biodiversity, and natural beauty. But today, people in Africa, like people around the world, are confronted by multiple crises. One was obviously spending those seven years with my mother. I, I really never knew that when I, when actually more than that, it was almost 10 years, working with her every single day. That was a highlight because so few of us can say that, right? We live in the same city, some of us with our mothers, and we don't see them as often. Once you get into your professional life, your family life, you really just get consumed by that. So that I was able to spend that kind of time with her, really enjoying each other's company. We had such fun visiting some of the most beautiful places in the world. That was and remains a highlight for me and, and something that I will always have that is precious because it can't happen again, right? So she's not here. So I feel like that to me, the biggest highlight. And honestly, I go back to my decision to come home and I pin it to that was why. And if I had made a split second decision not to come, that's what I would have missed is those moments. So that to me, by far the highlight. The other highlights I think are, um, you know, of and, and we're talking about work related things is the foundations work. Just beginning to see uh, the Greenbelt movement find its feet, settle down after my mother's passing, you know, the vision holder is gone and so the organization is in turbulence and it's it's struggling to find its feet. And we had uh, one of my friends gave me, I have think for the longest time, the most profoundly uh, exciting uh, symbol of what was happening. He says, when the great sequoia tree drops, when a huge tree drops in the forest, it is tumultuous, it's crazy, it's, it's disorienting but it also allows for the small trees that are under to grow and to thrive. The third is really the work of the foundation, just finding another element of my mother's legacy that gave me such joy and also allowed me to continue to advance the legacy that she had started in a different way. Just acknowledging that the Greenbelt movement will always be the the legacy and her work that she started, but that there are other ways that we can honor her. And I remember um, with the board of the Greenbelt Movement, of the Wangari Mathai Foundation, thinking, let's focus this work on children. And there had been a survey that East African Institute at the Aga Khan University had just released then that was around youth and the youth, East African Youth Survey. And we anchored our work on the, on the findings of that survey. And that was a Highlight. It was a feeling of buoyancy to know here's another path that needed us and here we are. This is my hometown of Nairobi. I love Nairobi, it's beautiful. But it is a city of paradoxes. It is at once beautiful and challenging. Oh my goodness, my journey less complicated than others, right? I think for us, um, it's been, it's been a lot easier because the people who really had it were our parents, their parents perhaps, and that was uh, watching them and, and it's our fathers and our mothers in a very difficult time in our country when we were under a dictatorial leadership. And it was difficult for them to stick their heads out and many of them did. Many of them had to leave this country and live elsewhere, but were so committed to the future of of Kenya they so loved, uh, that they inspired us to keep that going. And so that, that um, I would say, was a much harder path. I will never complain that my path was difficult. I don't think I deserve that kind of, 
of platform, but I think that it is, I can only say they inspired us. They, they helped us see, uh, and there are many of them, there, there are so many uh, great Kenyans who inspire us to this day. I'm especially inspired by one Greta Thunberg from Sweden, whose words during her recent TED talk inspired me greatly. She said everyone keeps saying that climate change is an existential threat, and yet they just carry on like before. I don't understand it, because if climate change is caused by emissions, and these emissions have to stop, then we must stop the emissions. To me, it's black and white. The green movement and, and the movement to, to ensure that we have a green country is really an important one. It is the most important movement at the moment. I remember my mother always used to say, the Ministry of for Environment is the most important ministry, but it doesn't get the budgetary support. And it's, you know, she really believed that. We've got to believe that. And I think we do, thanks to the work of organizations like the Green Belt Movement. We understand how important green spaces are in this country, how important our trees are. We feel the pain when we see trees coming down along Waiyaki Way to make way for an expressway. We feel the pain. But how many of us have joined the Daima campaign? When we invite you to come to Uhuru Park to say we want Uhuru Park to remain Daima Uhuru Park, come out and support. For young people, if you do one thing, it is extremely important that you become part of a, an organization, a movement, something. Pick a cause and join. Find other people who are in it, find organizations who are in it, and make it your business to be part of that movement. It needs you. She always told me that there's something special about scientists. We always think about why, what is the root cause? Why is this happening? Why are these issues um, affecting us in the way they are? And whatever the issues she was dealing with at the time, she always came back to why. I continue to support the work of the, of the Wangari Maathai Foundation and the Green Belt Movement. I feel my, my legacy is really in, in this leadership space, to create a platform for young people to engage in leadership in ways beyond our traditional understanding of leadership. That wherever they are, they're leaders. They're in the banking sector, they're lawyers. I tell people all the time my favorite story about the Greenbelt Movement and some of the activism that we did. Karura Forest included, Uhuru Park. A lot of those advocacy activities were thanks to information from young people sitting in a law firm, sitting in a bank, who saw something and said something. I don't think this is right. I don't think Uhuru Park should be turned into a 60-story building. I'm gonna give this information to somebody who can do something with it. So our leadership is all in all those places and, and in the media, as you cover these stories, to give prominence and visibility to the issues that matter. If you don't cover them, who will? Right? Thank God for the democratization of media. Now we can tweet and we can get our stories out. But we need mainstream media to also say this is important and to give the microphone to people who are doing that important work. It is very important for poor people to understand that the more you, add a de add, um, the more you degrade your environment, the more you uh, mismanage your environment, the more you are likely to uh, dig yourself deeper into poverty. You have to be your own source, your deepest source of motivation. Don't expect anybody else to motivate you. It has to start from you. And that the success you experience across your life, your life's work, but also in your personal life, um, has to be a function of digging deep within. And that has been a really important lesson for me and, and has been a great source of buoyancy and strength to know that actually, what am I doing about it for myself? Not to expect other people to do it for me or to motivate me, that I must motivate myself and seize the moment.